Turn with me to Luke, the fifth chapter, and I'm going to read the first 11 verses of Luke chapter 5, and they are loaded with truth and meaning, and revelation knowledge for all of us. Luke chapter 5, verse 1, and it came to pass that as the people pressed upon Jesus to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. And saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said, Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draw, for a tremendous catch of fish. And Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we've toiled all the night and taken nothing. And nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net brake. Really what happened here, their net started to break. They needed help. And they beckoned unto their partners. Can I hear you say Partners which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. Doesn't mean they sank. It was just overload. That means that they were returning to shore with a boatload capacity of fish. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the catch of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners. Could you say partners again? With Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth you will catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. And it came to pass when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy. And he goes on to more miracles in his life. I brought a message that God gave me. It's, it's a title that God gave me. God gives me certain insights by titles into things. And I was reading one day and God spoke this to my heart. Partners catch more fish. Partners catch more fish. And of course, the proof is here in Luke chapter 5. Now, we're all different, some more than others. Some are very different, some are just slightly different. But we all have something or some things that the body of Christ needs. If you're sitting here today or wherever you hear my voice, there's something that you have that the body of Christ really needs. And it's a lie of the devil that says you have nothing to contribute. That's not true. We have great diversity even in our ministry staff. Wonderful talents and gifts and measures. And I thank God. Actually, we have fivefold in our ministry staff. God's called me increasingly the last few years into the function, the office of an apostle. And certainly scripturally, as I understand it, we qualify in that. But those that work with us, there's the diversity of all of these ministries. And we have, even in our staff, the ability to go out and to evangelize or to pray for the sick, to do the various aspects of the ministry. So we have a great diversity. You see, there's another problem that as ministers, we all have some blind spots where we need others who love us to share their measure with us. I need you and you need me. Every time I see Stitch's trailer pulling out, I just say, thank God we're out there where the action is. This is raw frontline street evangelism in communities. And if you think it's a piece of cake, you go try it. I get amused at folks that think they're called to the mission field. They don't last but two weeks in stitches. Saving the inner city through Christ, hope, eternal salvation. In fact, I, 
I need to get in Bible school and tell everyone there, if you think you're ever going to do anything for God, you need to spend some time in the power tower and you need to spend some time in stitches and you need to get involved in frontline ministries. You don't buy an airline ticket and go somewhere else and all of a sudden it just happens. No way. You start where you are. And I think of uh, so many things. You know, if, if you think ministering in jails and prisons is a piece of cake, you're wrong. When that old door goes kaflunk, you better have the anointing of God. You don't have the praise singers behind you. You don't have all the, some, I've talked to ministers, well, I can't minister, I can't function if I don't have a certain thing, honey. Also, Paul found out he could minister anywhere, anytime, because the apostle Paul and Jesus made a majority. They could even take away your guitar and you can still minister because ministry is on the inside of you, see. We look at people that are doing these things, we think, oh, you know, just peace. No, 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 no. There's a price tag to anything you do for God. There's a price tag to anything you do for God. Partners together can get the job done. Partners together can get the job done. And you might say, well, I'm up in years and I can't do what I used to. Hey, that's all right. God understands that. I talked to one of the precious men of this church. His health has been challenged. He said, Pastor, I want to be there for you. I said, you've been there for me for many, many years, and you will be when you get to feeling better. But just me talking to you and know you're praying for me, that means more than I could ever tell you. He said, but I want to physically be there. I said, you'll be there when you can be because he always has been. But you see, the word partners is mentioned twice. Here in Luke chapter 5, it's mentioned in verse 7 and mentioned in verse 10. Now, you hear so much about partners today. And it kind of started a couple of years ago when some folks came up and said, oh, I get to be a partner in a ministry. And I thought, boy, something's missing on this page. Every Sunday you get to be a partner in this ministry. I mean, you don't have to sign your life away to be a partner. You, every Sunday... You're a partner whether you put a penny or a nickel or a dime or a dollar or a five or a ten. And I'm telling you, Joe and I, we rejoice in being partners with this ministry because every week this ministry is getting souls saved all over the world. All over the world. Through Fort Worth, even in our regular services. And I've told anyone making an altar call, if one person comes forward, that's worth the whole day's work right there. If no one comes forward, we were obedient to God and giving the opportunity to come forward and accepting Christ. There's some churches it's hard to get saved in those churches because the opportunity is never given. Now, what about this word partner? Well, as we look at this word partner, it means those with a measure. It's a limited portion. Well, I thought we... We're complete in Christ. You're complete in Christ, but you don't have all the gifts of the body of Christ. We all have talents and gifts and giftings and abilities. And a lot of you and most of us have some little something that others don't seem to have. A limited portion, a part, a share of, or an associate. Well, that's good, isn't it? You see, because of your partnership with this ministry, you can say, well, I'm an associate of Calvary Cathedral International. And you would be accurate. A partaker. A partaker. You see, it's one in agreement and fellowship. And there was another insight shared by all. You see, we're parts but all of our parts coming together means that we're all sharing in something wonderful. You see, believers' commitment to a common cause would be a paraphrase from our day and time, a believer's commitment to a common cause in your heart, in your time, your prayer, your faith, your loyalty, your money. It all goes together. It starts in your heart. What's in your heart affects your time. Results in prayer, results in faith, results in you're believing the word of God. You know, it's loyalty. I've discovered the last few years that faithfulness is wonderful, but you can be faithful and not be loyal. You can punch a clock, be there on time. You can do everything letter perfect. You can be faithful, but be faithful grudgingly. 
or be faithful in a very dry way. But loyalty is a locked in commitment. You see, faithfulness goes pretty well until something happens that I don't agree with or something that disturbs me. But loyalty locks in. My wife and I are not only faithful to one another, we're loyal to one another. She's my partner. And I'm her partner. And our partnership gets stronger by the day. So when you look at this word partner, they're in this storm and all this is happening. And it was partners that made the difference. One in agreement and fellowship. And it's shared by all. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and then I'll get to the heart of the matter here in just a moment, but 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 13 through 15, it's a fascinating study. I mean 13, 14, and 15, but in three or four verses and one or two other verses of that chapter, Paul speaks of his measure. Now, what is your measure? Your measure is your gifting, your gifts. There's not a preacher in the world that hasn't heard Billy Graham preach and say, I say that all the time, but it doesn't come out that way. Because Billy Graham is Billy Graham. He's gifted to be who he is, how he is, and how he ministers. And so the Apostle Paul speaks of his measure, that we all have different measures. Be a crazy body if you were just a series of thumbs. You see, we're not just eyes, we're not just feet, we're not just hands. But our body is made up of parts, body parts, which make up who you are and what you are. So Paul said we have different measures, that we're not to constantly compare our measure with the measure of others. I found out many years ago, there's ministers that I can't compete with and I don't want to compete with. I respect their gift and their gifting. And one day I was just really frustrated several years ago and I thought, well, Lord, why can't I do something like this? And why don't we see more here? Why can't we do that? And God said, well, let me explain it to you this way. They can't do what you're doing. And I didn't call you to do what they're doing. See, the wisest day in your life is when you find out that God gave you a measure and God gave you a talent and God gave you giftings and God gave you abilities. And no matter how many children you have, they're all going to be a little different. God made us that way. There's, o- there's only one original thumbprint and that's yours. One fingerprint and God gave that to you. We're not to constantly compare our measure with the measure of others. The thing we need to be concerned about is that I'm using my measure as God's called me to use my measure. There's a time in church when the best thing you can do is sit and soak. I've seen some people, they just get nervous as a, you know, if they can't do everything at the same time. I'm going to tell you, I've seen people fry. I've seen people burn out. I've seen people just run out of, out of gas. And the wisest thing you need to learn is that there's a time for you to sit and soak. I know preachers won't come and listen to another preacher. They will not come and listen to another preacher. If they're preaching in a conference, they don't even show up unless they're preaching. I don't have those kind of preachers here. It bothers me. Something's missing. There's something there that uh, that God needs to work on. Paul said, we will not boast of things beyond our measure. But according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us. See, we're all included in this measure. Everyone has a measure. You have something. You do something. You're gifted with something that no one else is gifted just like you are. There is no such thing as a nobody in the kingdom of God. Some have a very quiet personality. Some are very outgoing and bombastic, and we need all of it. We need all of that. Paul said, we will not boast of things beyond our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, so we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure. I could call a number of ministries today that I admire them, I admire the giftings, I admire the anointings in their life, but that's not what I'm called to do. 
And so I enjoy those giftings. I enjoy those anointings when, when available. But I must concentrate on the measure that God has entrusted to me. Some people, in fact, I talked to someone the other day, they just, just can't wait to get to the mission field. Now let me give you an example. We needed a manager for our television station over in Kampala, Uganda. I mean, there was a desperate need. And so we called in a couple of folks that all I heard, they're not here anymore, but all I heard was Africa, Africa, visions and dreams. They wore Africa dresses. They wore Africa necklaces. I mean, the animals were just a jumping when they would walk. In fact, they had even been to Africa. I don't know what happened when they were there, but. And so, you know, we thought, well, man, all these people that are handing in prayer requests and come to be prayed for, please pray that I can go to Africa. We'll just call them in between one or two of them. Well, we'll have our candidate for Africa. It's kind of like when, they, when David was made king, you know, called in and anointed. Man called him in. And I mean, they had their total own agenda. Oh, they would go there if we'd send them there, but they were going to do this and that and this and that. You couldn't get a word in edgewise. And I thought about something Brother Hagin said. He said, you know, someone came to me for wisdom and advice, and for two hours I never got a word in edgewise. And I said, well, it's been nice to talk to you. And they left his presence. When you're in the presence of some wisdom, you better listen up. It's hard to find. It can be found, but it's hard to find. And I mean, the immaturity, I just wanted to jump up and scream, but I disciplined myself and I said, yeah, say, man, God bless you. Well, thank you for coming. And so finally I thought, what are we going to do? Well, we were praying in the office there and Brother Dale, he said, well, what about Gary Everett? Now, to be honest with you, I knew who Gary was, but I'd never spent time with Gary. He was a busy young man and, and did all those things. And so I began to check around. I said, who is, what about Gary? And I found out that he was faithful. And I found out that he was low profile. And I found out that he wasn't a boat rocker. And I found out that his word was his bond. And I found out that he paid his bills on time. And I found out that he had a passport and he was ready to go. And I found out that he, that 12 years before that time he had graduated with a master's degree from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary and his calling was missions, but because he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, he had been kind of removed from certain circles. And so he said, if I can't go preach and be a missionary and do what I want to do, I'll just do what I can do. So he was busy doing what he could find to do. Folks, I'm giving you so much wisdom right now. I mean, some people would say, oh, you, you, th you think they're just going to parachute you on the mission field and all of a sudden you're going to be a little bubbly and everything's just going to fall in place? No way, man. You see, you go to the mission field, it means totally leaving everything behind. Now, some, some mission fields are closer than others, but not the one we're talking about, you go there on purpose. You work to get there. And you don't take a little one and a half or three hour flight and you're back home. You have to fly in stages to get there. It's almost 24 hours that you spend to even get there by airplane. And then there's the food. Jesus have mercy. Boy, you find one or two restaurants where it agrees with you, and I mean, you just pester them. You just, you're there. They say, you back again? That lady in that restaurant said, I can't believe you, you folks eat here every night. And I said, yeah, the food, <laughs> food's good. <laughs> she said, well, other people come and they go to different restaurants. I said, we'll be back. <laughs> and then there's the culture. And they have a right to their culture like we have a right. But what I'm saying is everything is totally different. The food's different. People are different. Customs are different. You can't just say anything you want to say. You can't just explode and do your little thing. You're on strange turf. You're on someone else's turf. And then you have to watch your words and you have to be a living epistle born and read of all men. Oh, the wisdom that it takes just to go be an effective missionary. It's not just this standing up in signs, wonders, and miracles, honey. There's a whole other world. The ministry is what you do between the times you preach or teach. 
The ministry is what you do between the times that you stand behind the pulpit or stand up and minister. It's who you are and what you are and how you live your life and your morals and your money and everything else that goes into it. You've got to know how to pace yourself. And on days and weeks when nothing is happening, you must know how to prime your own pump. And even as Paul, who said, I think myself happy. And we got through with two candidates and we thought, boy, they're just it. I mean, that's all we've heard years ago. All we've heard was missions. Man, when we found out what their agenda was, it was scary. They came to tell us what they were going to do. <laughs> Didn't think about asking what we wanted and what we needed. But the man God called was quiet, low profile, paid his bills on time. He and his wife both had a passport. He had been doing what he could do to get to do one day what he hoped he had been called to do. And so all of a sudden, all those gifts and talents and abilities that seemed like they were just locked up in a closet somewhere, a man who's working a secular job and there's not a thing or well wrong with that, doing everything he could in ministry of helps here and before he'd come here in another church, checked on, he'd been very faithful. It, it, it means something to be faithful in the power tower. It means something to be faithful in the community outreaches. God calls and uses faithful people. David was faithful in caring for the livestock of his father. David was careful that even when he was called to the front line, some people said, whoo, happy days are here again. <laughs> Fool on you, sheep. But he left his sheep in charge of someone else. He was not irresponsible. He made sure his bases were covered. David was a tremendous example just going to the front lines of the way he handled things. Well, that's seemingly a little detour from the message today, but folks, I'm talking to you out of my heart. You know, we think, well, you know, if I, I prayed that I'd get to do something and I, one month's gone by, so we're just out of here. You know, it may take, with Brother Gary, it took years of preparation to school him to be where he is today. And the position that he's in today, he just wept when we were over there. He said, Pastor, thank you for calling us and believing in us. And, and we take good care of them over there. And we make sure they have dependable transportation and live in a, in a safe place. And we're, we're good to them. And he said, we just thank you. He said, we fare better than any missionary that we're aware of in Uganda. Well, it ought to be that way. He's manager of our television station there. A measure. You see, he could have wondered if his measure would have ever been used, but there was a day when his measure was used. Partners are a measure of the body of Christ. They're a part of the body of Christ. Remember we sing the song, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. You're a part. I'm a part. This church is a part of the family of God. So we all have God-given talents, gifts, and measures, all of our gifts, talents, and measures are to increase and grow. Even though it may start small, we're to grow and grow up. We all are a piece of the puzzle. All of us. And we're called the kingdom of God in a local church. And I saw this years ago, a full service church. That's when banks were banks back years ago. They came up with full service banking. And the average church was Sunday morning, maybe Sunday night, maybe Wednesday night, not much happening in between. But oh, something in my heart said, oh, church can be Christian education. Church can be Bible school. Church can be outreach. Church can be missions. Church can be radio. Church, church can be all kind of hooks in the water reaching out to do the work of God. And today that's exactly what Calvary Cathedral International is and what we have been for many, many years. I was born for the supernatural. I was born for faith. I was born for revival. My mother saw to that. But I mean, if it's God, you don't drive too fast for me. I may sit there and look calm, but I, I'm not calm on the inside. I was born for the supernatural. I was born to see cities saved. I was born to see young people come to the Lord. I opened an old Strong's Concordance that I had and out fell a newspaper clipping from the youth <laughs> revival that we had years ago. And man, you talk about going back a few years. 
and how that God just jettisoned us out of ordinary church at that time. But you can't drive too fast for me by God's grace. Amen. I love the supernatural. I love revival. Man, if I could pull the lever and we'd go till Jesus comes, I'd pull that lever today. I'd punch that button today. But I've lived long enough. No, you don't manipulate it. You can't make it happen. There are times and there are seasons and you have to be on God's wavelength. But if you stay around here long enough, you'll see it all or what God wants you to see. But you see, partnership is when all of our talents and pieces and measures come together as a common cause. When all of us come together. See, it's not just me, but God does call pastors. But it's when you and you and you, and men and women and teenagers, young married couples, there is not one unimportant person in this room today. I am so strongly aware that I know that the Spirit of God is guiding the comments that I make today because I have not made plans for most of the things that I've said to this point. I'm a measure. Say it with me. I'm a measure. I'm a part. I have a gift. I have a talent. I have abilities. I have potential. But I'm not all of it. I'm a part of it. But my part of the puzzle and your part of the puzzle and our part of the puzzle coming together is awesome. See, that's the body of Christ. That's the body of Christ. And you know, I've said something in teaching through the years. You're never out of the will of God when you're preparing to do the will of God. I want to say that again because it bears repeating. You're never out of the will of God when you're preparing to do the will of God. Do you think Abraham's miracles happened overnight? Do you think Noah's miracle happened overnight? What a, it gives me a headache. 120 year building program. Where's the rain? Flood what? <laughs> and you look at Bible characters, the years that some of them had to wait. Folks, we, we need to thank God every day. We see things so quickly. Really, things come to pass so quickly for us, more than we realize. Do you realize we're not even two years past the storm? Look at all the miracles that God's given us. Why, it's a Hebrews, another Hebrews 11. It's another children of Israel leaving the land of Egypt. I was reading that on the plane and this past week and just, oh, man, every time I reread the Bible, I'm going through the Bible again this year, I see things that I've preached in and around and about, but there's something else I see. It's amazing how much you see when you read the Bible for yourself. So I think this is what God's speaking to us in Calvary Cathedral International where parts, where measures, we're sharers, we're associates, we're partakers, we're pieces of the puzzle, but together we all make up the puzzle that is called the kingdom of God, the body of Christ. And let me tell you this, there is no stronger, more rewarding, more scriptural partnership than that that you have with the local church. I think the local church has been overlooked far too long. You know where to find us. You know where we live. You know our lifestyles. You know who we are. You see our track record. And I thank God for the ministry of the local church. To be a partner with this ministry is one of the most scriptural, rewarding partnerships that you could ever have. Now, let me give you some of the high points quickly because we're still in Luke chapter 5. Partners catch more fish. By myself, I can't catch the fish that I can catch with you. I cannot catch all the fish that we can catch together. By myself, Uganda could not be. By myself, all the outreaches could not be. You see, there's a gifting for Christian education. There's a gifting for Bible school. There's a gifting for every ministry that is here. But you see, in chapter 5, verse 1 of Luke, here is what every church is all about or should be all about. The people pressed upon Jesus to hear the word of God. Nowadays, I, sometimes I don't know what to think about modern trends. It seems like the word of God's the last thing we're going to hear. We hear philosophy. We hear a little bit. We hear a little stimulant. We get a little pablum. We get a little encouragement. But I'm talking about 
the real meat of the Word of God. The Bible said they were pressing upon Jesus. Why? To get the Word of God. The Bible should be the most important book in your library. The Bible should be the most important book in your possession. I thank God for books about the Bible, but nothing takes the place of reading the Bible for yourself and believing it. You see what every church is all about or should be all about is a hunger for God and his word, a passion for souls, and all of us growing up spiritually. How sad it is to see people who have been around churches for years who are pygmies. Their growth is stunted. Their faith is limited. Their little circle of conversation, you could go, I met someone the other day I haven't seen for 20 years, so help me God, their conversation hasn't changed from 20 years ago. Listen to me, child of God. I'm a different man than I was 20 years ago. I'm a different man than I was two years ago. I'm a different man than I was two months ago. And by the grace of God, I'm a different man than I was two weeks ago. What every church is all about is a hunger for the word of God, a passion for souls, and all of us growing up spiritually, growing stronger. Secondly, what concerned Jesus deeply? I'll tell you what concerned him deeply. He saw idle ships, empty nets, and fishermen not fishing. Let me say that one more time. He saw idle ships. He knew what they were capable of. He saw empty nets. You don't catch fish with empty nets. And he saw fishermen not fishing. Didn't Jesus say, follow me and I'll make you to become fishers of men? See, he knew what that boat was for. He knew what those nets were for. He knew what those fishermen could do, but they were not doing it. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Never forget the Sunday. I call it a preacher killing Sunday. And our first little piece of property, when we'd worked so hard to get that little chapel presentable and, and get a building ready, and man, we had a Sunday when half the teachers didn't show up and half of everybody didn't show up, and I, I, I preached and I felt like I was just spitting cotton. I mean, it just it seemed like every word you just struggle, and nothing went right that day. And I went back to my office. I wasn't hungry. I said, God, I'll do anything that's right and I'll do anything that works to win souls for you. We are not winning souls to Jesus in this church. And God, the next few days, sent in an opportunity that at that time almost overwhelmed me, but I said, yes, we'll do it. And we're here wherever we are today. The good part of where we are is because in the yesterdays, we said, whatever, however long it takes, whatever it takes, Whatever the price tag is, God, if it's right and if it works, we'll do it. And we started seeing people saved in our church, and it's never stopped since then. Concern Jesus deeply, idle ships, empty nets, fishermen. God's not interested in your feel good without the fruits. God's not interested in your feeling good without the fruits. Now, the third insight we see in Luke chapter 5 is that when you let Jesus enter your ship, when you loan your ship to Jesus, exciting things begin to happen. To me? Yeah, you. You realize the risk Peter took in loaning his ship to Jesus? He's a preacher, you know. Jesus is a teacher and a preacher. He doesn't know anything about fishing. When Peter loaned his ship to Jesus, he loaned Jesus his payroll his crew, withholding taxes. If somebody gets hurt, they're going to sue you. It's a pretty big risk to loan Jesus your boat, or is it? Because when you present your body a living sacrifice unto the Lord, he takes your measure, he takes your gifts, he takes your talents, he takes your giftings, and things start to change. I could not pastor an ordinary church. I'd find something else to do. But I'm telling you that when Jesus enters your boat, and there's only one reason we're in these properties, and that's to let Jesus have every square inch of these properties that he wants. To let Jesus use every square inch of this building. When I walked in and saw the seating comparable to our former auditorium, I said, well, at least we don't, we don't go backwards. We're not retreating. We'd go forward. There's got to be room for revival. There must be room to flex. There must be room to grow. There must be room to see more from God. 
When Jesus enters your ship, exciting things begin to happen. I believe that I'm going to be where I ought to be. Give what I should give. Respond like I should. I'm not just going to wake up in the morning, you know, and just bump against the walls. I'm waking up with purpose. I'm living with purpose. When Jesus enters your ship, exciting things begin to happen. Now, there's something else that these are such exciting things. Jesus will be debtor to no man. I'm just not free to talk about some things that God does for Joy and I because they're so supernatural. We've done some of the crazy, crazy in the natural. We've given, we've, I mean, we, we do stuff all the time. It's crazy. It's just crazy. But you know, God just keeps blessing and God helps us. And even though our faith has been challenged in so many ways, I'm telling you, you don't just put it in the offering plate and say, okay, God, do your thing. That's not, you, no, 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 no. You mix faith with it. And you keep on mixing faith with it. And you don't quit on your first day and you don't quit on your worst day. And you don't quit when the pressure's on. And you don't quit when your heart's broken. And you don't quit when you're tired. And you don't quit when everything kind of seems to be confusing. Oh, listen to me, child of God. We're raising a church of winners more than conquerors. We're not just marking time. Praise God, we're more than conquerors. And Jesus will be debtor to no man. All right, Jesus uses Peter's boat. You can say, Peter said, oh, bookkeeper, what's this going to cost me? Let that preacher drive my car. Let that preacher drive my truck. Let that preacher have my warehouse. What? Ooh, what's it going to cost me? But all of a sudden, Peter discovers what God wants all of us to know that God will be debtor to no man. After Jesus used his boat to preach the word of God, he said, launch out. Exciting things are getting ready to happen. <laughs> oh, we've come through deep waters. We're still coming through. But oh, we've let Jesus use our boat. We've let Jesus use our schools. We've let Jesus use our facilities. In the news, we refuse to be negative. We speak positive. They say it's bad luck. I said, no, we're blessed. They say you've lost everything. I said, no, we'll come out with twice as much. When you let Jesus use your boat, get ready, get ready, get ready. The best is yet to come. If you think I'm bragging on me, not so. It's Jesus. If not here, where? If not now, when? If not me, who? God's going to use somebody. Another truth here that Peter speaks the truth in a nutshell. He said, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Tell me something else different. <laughs> you see what he's talking about is works without faith. Our best efforts without obedience. You don't sample the things of God. Sometimes in a restaurant, you know, you, get a, you can order a sample, sample order of fish or sample order of that. You don't sample the things of God. You just, I found out in the old swimming hole, man, you're told, say, there's no way, this water's too cold. You put your foot in, it's, your body says you're crazy. There's just one way to handle the old swimming hole, and that's dive into that cold water. And after a while, it's, it's okay. And there's only one way to handle the kingdom of God, and that's just to dive in. Master, we've toiled all night. I've done my thing. I've done it my way. We've caught nothing. Nothing. A word that no one likes to acknowledge. Nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word. Nevertheless, at thy word. Nevertheless, at thy word. That shall not return unto him void. Nevertheless, at thy word, Lord, nevertheless, at thy word, we will let down the net for a catch of fish. I've learned a long time ago, Bob can't do it, but Jesus can. Bob can't do it, but the Holy Ghost can. Bob Nichols can't do it, but oh, thank God, Father God is an author of taking nothing and making something out of it. Now we learn another powerful kingdom of God truth principle here, and that is that partners catch more fish. All right, they're catching all these fish, and the nets begin to break. 
because we can't do it by ourselves. And they call over other partners. Now God's again beginning to bring in other partners to be a part of this great body from the north, the south, the east, and the west. And the other partners come in, and their catch of fish would have been lost if the partners of the other ship. You see, we're all working together. The various ministries and departments are not that department. These are our people. These are ours. Hey, we're, we're us. We're us. We're us. It's all of us. All of us. And so they call. They said, partners, help us. We need help. And they said, okay. And so they sailed over with their little ship and they joined their nets together. And before long, instead of one ship, instead of one net being full, now there's two ships and two nets full of fish. And partners really do catch more fish. Their catch of fish would have been lost if the partners of the other ship had not helped them. Now, there's one final truth that I must give you. Are you getting something out of God's Word today? Finally, I want you to see the only way that any of us can be successful, that when they brought the ship to land, follow me, child of God, when they brought the ship to land, they were willing to forsake all. Willing to forsake all. I talked to two or three ministers out of the city just this week. We're always depending on somebody else doing something supernatural for us. I've just learned you, God better be your source. <laughs> I thank God for everybody's promises and for everybody's whatever. But let me tell you, God's your source. I've told you the story time and time again of the millionaire that said, Bob, if you ever start a church, I'll be there. You know, after all these years, you'd think he'd have shown up. Since 1964, he's not been in one service. And he's still in this city. And he sends a message every once in a while. Oh, I believe in you and I'm for you. Okay. I can tell you how to be for me a little bit better. How to help me out. How to help catch fish. I appreciate your goodwill. But you've got something else that could be of help too. But that's in God's hands too. I want you just to notice. Finally see the only way that any of us can be successful. When they brought the ship to land. There were two things they did. They forsook all and they followed Jesus. You know, nothing's ever worked in my life or ministry unless I gave it everything I had. I just refuse to have a divided mind. Paul said this one thing I do. And you've got to do what you have to do before you get to do. <laughs> you wouldn't believe some of the things I did when I was still in Bible college. You'd laugh. Some of the things we did to generate a little tiny bit of cash. I've, I've done some hard labor things. I've done some strange things. I've done some unusual things. But God saw that and God honored it and now it's a different day. But when I gave my life to Jesus, I said, Lord, I give you all of it, the rest of it. And if you can trade for junk and take my junk and make something out of it, Lord, just do it. The Word of God said when they pull that ship to shore. You know, it's amazing. A lot of people, when they get their needs met, they say, Oh, hey, thanks for praying with me. I'll see you later. Three or four years, you meet them in a shopping mall somewhere. Oh, we're so desperate when we need our miracle. We're so desperate when we need a break. Huh. Well, I mean, we just we call the power tower. We call all our relatives. We call every ministry in the world. And then when God meets our need, oh, well, that, that's good. I guess it would have happened anyway. Never want to forget what God's done. I never want to forget God's faithfulness. I'll never forget that God believed in me when no one believed in me or very few believed in me. There's something in my heart today more than ever before. I not only want to forsake all, but I want to follow Jesus. I want less of me and more of him. I want more of his power, more of his grace, more of his anointing. This is not an hour to figure out how we can do less I talk to some people that say, well, you know, I used to give a lot, but, you know, but, but. And so it's a bass boat, and so it's, so it's a bigger truck, and so it's a, oh, that's okay. You give God his part, and you'll have all those things in divine order. But let me tell you, this is not an hour to figure out how you can do less for God. This is an hour to go forward as never before. I mean, it's an hour to 
to trust God as you've never trusted God before because the best is yet to come. And I don't have that message together. I've been saying it for years. But you know, about the last 13 chapters of Genesis was all about Joseph. The man that had it so hard, the man that had it so bad, but the man who refused to quit, refused to have a negative testimony, refused to bad mouth, poor mouth, the man that in good times, bad times, prison or on the throne, just kept on praising God. And the last 13 chapters of Genesis, he was able to bless his father. He was able to bless all his brothers. Joseph was the man on campus because he refused to quit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jacob, after he got straightened out and delivered from his former craziness, the most productive years of his life. And I just keep running all through the Bible, all through the Bible, the God of Jacob, the God of Jacob, the God of Jacob. The, man, if I was God, I'd be ashamed to be called the God of Jacob. But God said, a change has come in his life. That's what God's doing in us today. It's not business as usual. It's not who we are, who we used to be, but it's who we are now that counts with God. The God of Jacob. I don't even know how many times that's there. I've, I've got to do some more research on that. The God of Jacob, the God of Jacob, the God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all three of them were a piece of work at one time in their life, but they didn't quit and they just kept going forward. Don't you let adversity stop you. Don't you let disappointments turn you back. Don't you let someone letting you down ruin the rest of your life. Oh, thank God if you'll let Jesus continue to use your boat. Get ready, get ready for the catch of fishes. Get ready, get ready for the blessings of God. Get ready for some of the greatest harvest times of your life. Partners catch more fish. Partners really do catch more fish.